All right, we're going to get going. You ready for some cyber, cyber necromancy? Yeah? All right, so next up we have um, Matthew Halishak and <clears throat> Joseph uh, Tartaro. I hope I didn't butcher out too bad doing a reverse, engineer, a reverse engineering dead protocols. Give him a warm welcome. All right, so you didn't uh, butcher my name too badly there. Um, but uh, I'm Matthew from Security Innovation, uh, basically experiencing with web app, pen testing, and pen testing of pretty much anything, uh, code reviews, all that fun stuff. And I'm Joseph Tartaro with IOActive, and I just play Metal Gear Solid all day. So just as we get started, um, I do want to mention this isn't a development project. Uh, we're not going to be talking about the actual like process of writing server client software. Um, there are other conferences that you can go to that would deal with stuff like that. Uh, we're not dealing too much with exploitation. We're not going to be um, you know, doing any type of overflows in there, memory corruption stuff. Uh, it's just kind of a cool project that we did. And some people were interested in the process, so we figured we'd give it a shot and actually do a presentation on it. So the actual project itself, uh, Save MGO, uh, the whole idea is we had a game that we both played. Uh, I, mine was Metal Gear Online 1. It came out on the PS2 in 2006. And the other one was Metal Gear Online 2, which came out in 2008 on the PS3. Uh, the game was up for a fairly short period of time. I want them up for a year, the other one for a couple years. And then the game company shut it down. And we basically just set forth trying to rebuild that server, trying to recreate that without actually having a whole lot of resources. We didn't start out with a pack capture. Uh, unlike building a lot of private servers, we didn't start out with things like um, actually being able to test against the live server. We were just kind of left with, here's a dead server, here's the client, let's build the server from the client. Yeah, so some of the um, high level problems that you run into is, um like I said, this the real server was offline. Uh, we had a minimal packet capture that uh, somebody from the team uh, was able to get, and uh, the game offered no LAN play. So uh, you've seen people use something like Xlink Kai and and trick the console to think you're on LAN and play over the internet. Uh, we were unable to do that. Another main issue was that these were console games. PS2 and PS3, it wasn't like building a private server for a computer where we could just debug the process and run with it. Um, for the PS2, for example, there's no open debugging interface. Um, it wasn't an easy process of viewing the memory. Uh, we had a way to do it with uh, a PS2 emulator called uh, PCSX2, and we could create save states, and that would dump the memory, and we were able to just look through it from there. Um, as for PS3, uh, the actual game was removed with an official update, so you had to avoid updating the game and avoid PSN, and it requires custom firmware to run any unsigned code and actually modify anything. So uh, one of the first things is we have to redirect the traffic and make sure that it's going to us, and then implement any known protocols. Uh, HTTP, stun, uh, what have you, and then implement the actual game protocol, which we have no idea what it is at this time. So for traffic redirection, uh, pretty basic. Uh, you can start by uh, patching, but for things like the PS2, it's not realistic. You're not going to patch a binary and press the disk and ship it off to people and let them run it on their console. Uh, so you could buy the domain, but is it still owned by the company? Is it available? Could you take over the domain? Is that legal? Um, or you can just do custom DNS. It's nothing new, it's nothing fancy, but it works fine. So that's what we ran with. So uh, stun protocol uh, is the first protocol we implemented. It's really, we didn't really implement it. It's a non-issue, you run your own or point it to a public stun. Uh, so we've done both. Right now, I think we're just pointing it to a public one, and it takes care of that issue, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, so this is kind of the first challenge that we came up with, uh, the dynamic network authentication. This is how Sony on the PS2 would prevent cheating online and also just uh, piracy. This is where they do the piracy checks, uh, making sure that you actually own the disk that you're trying to play online with and things of that nature. So bypassing it for piracy is pretty old. It was just a little patch. Um, I mean, if you're doing piracy, you can already 
uh, booth the burn game. So you just patch a little thing was like four or eight bytes in there and then you're good to go. Uh, for games no longer online, though, what happens is it doesn't even check if the disc, disc is legitimate. It just goes, hey, this game is online anymore. You can't connect. So what I tried to do initially with this project was building kind of a pure uh, rebuild of the server. You'd go, you'd just insert your disc and play. That was the ideal situation. So to do that, you'd have to rebuild this network authentication. So in trying to do that, I mean, we came across a leak of the Sony SDK. Uh, and there was actual documentation on how DNS worked. But ultimately, that was just a failure. Uh, we never actually managed to do that. But what we did end up doing was we found uh, this little string sitting there in code, a new DNS connect. Obviously, the big question at that point is, you know, what does this do? Where is it going? And what are you going to come up with if you try and you know, follow that down? Turns out we find a little function in there. And if you just return zero from it, you basically get a bypass. But as we already mentioned, kind of, there is that issue of binary patching. I mean, we can't just burn a new disk and press them and send them out to everybody. Uh, so what we end up finding out were cheat devices. Uh, I don't know how many of you, you know, if you use like a Game Shark, maybe a Game Genie, things like that. Uh, to me, when I was a kid, I used those on a few games and it was basically magic. I mean, it's just these characters that show up there and it's just like, I have no idea what these do, but they do magic. Uh, it turns out there is a little bit to it. And what these do is they'll actually overwrite little bytes of memory. I mean, if you know about the cheats, you already know what this does, but uh, basically there's just a little format to them. Uh, this could be pretty much a talk on its own, just talking about the complexity of some of these cheats. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to it. Uh, we kept it fairly simple for what we did in order to patch the binaries. We could overwrite just like four bytes of memory at a time using the, uh, you see the second bullet point there is two A, B. Uh, basically it would overwrite the address at zero X eight A with the value at B if you provide that first character to. If the first character was a C, then it was a conditional check. It would check if the memory address A was equal to the value of B. Uh, we use that because the game did some uh, packing, so it unpack itself. Uh, so we'd have to wait until it unpacked before we actually overwrote any memory in there. So. Uh, we'd use that to check, make sure it's unpacked, and then we'd overwrite memory. Otherwise, you just end up crashing the game. But yeah, I mean, these are look like magic to me, but they were quite helpful in this. Not a whole lot of overwriting. I mean, we can't do like a brand new map, have some huge code, but you can overwrite a few things like that, return zero. Uh, so the, uh, the PS3 is a little bit different. It runs the uh, PSN PlayStation Network, and uh, this is mainly used for account services, e-commerce, uh, friends list, joining games, all of that stuff, uh, store, DRM. Uh, so once, we, like we said, uh, with the PS2, same thing with the PS3. If you Google around, there is a leaked SDK out there. And um, we found this cute little function that uh, goes ahead and initializes the uh, network library. And it reads in a struct and there is a type for the struct, zero for a net game and one for a PSN game. And the way this works is uh, the net game, if it is a zero, it just checks, um, is your network device enabled? Is your ethernet or Wi-Fi enabled? Um, is a connection established? Do you have an IP address? If you do, it continues execution. Uh, if it's a type one PSN game, then like before, it does those checks, and then we'll check, is a PSN account registered on the console, which it stores in Flash, and it checks that. If not, it would prompt you to register for an account. If it was, then it would prompt you to authenticate. And then it checks if you are authenticated, then it continues on. So it's a pretty simple patch, just changed type to zero. But the issue with that is now all of the other PSN library calls were not initialized. So we lucked out because we had to go through the binary and either patch these out or fulfill their logic in some sort of way. And in our case of this game, it didn't use much of PSN. If you were going to do this to a game like Call of Duty or something that uses PSN for matchmaking, you'd have a lot more of this. But for us, we lucked out it was easy. So the first call was get network pro profile ID. Uh, I believe we just patched it, return zero, whatever. Um, the second one was to check if you're over 18. And um, we just wrote in there that everyone's over 18. And that was for uh, 
you know, parental control stuff. Uh, so the PS3 is a little bit different than PS2. Uh, we can actually patch the binaries and distribute them to people. Uh, they are just self binaries. They're packed, um, which are ELF files. And um, the only catch is that it requires custom firmware for you to actually execute this unsigned code because we have no way of signing it. Um, now, there are a lot of uh, IDA uh, scripts that were released, and uh, there'll be a link later on at the end of the slide deck that I'll have for you. Um, these scripts are extremely useful because somebody went through the SDK and mapped out, it auto maps the binary. So when you open it up and analyze it, you can analyze ELFs, you can analyze um, PS3 libraries, whatever, and it'll auto map all the SDK calls for you and make your life way easier. Uh, so the next protocol we had to implement was basic HTTP. Uh, for MGO1, it was just user registration, management, what have you. For MGO2, it was a little bit more. It would do version checks on what version of the game you're running to see if it should update. It would do authentication and a reward shop. Uh, the reward shop was basically in-game items like hats and masks, shirts, whatever. And it did not use real money. It used uh, fake currency or points that you would earn by killing people. But that's basically it. Um, so these are just some of the processes we went through for figuring out the HTTP stuff. Uh, a lot of it was uh, simple guesswork. Um, it works extremely well if you're ever in a situation just trying to get something to succeed on a client. Um, you know, we'd just do a response of null, and that would mean success, or a response of hex 30, which is the ASCII zero, et cetera, and just kind of toy with it from there. But if you have a chance to do live debugging, which on the PS3, if you have modified your console, you can turn it into a debug console and do live debugging on it, which was extremely useful. We did not have that access on the PS2. So if you are doing that, uh, what we did was kind of look at useful functions. So HTTP send, HTTP receive, URL decode, anything along those lines which you can set a breakpoint to and then start to step through and hope to find where a comparison is. So in the corner you can see a, a little screenshot of an IDA graph. The reason I stuck this in here is because it just showed, I think I stopped on like URL decode or something and went, uh, went to the next function and you can kind of see a large switch case at the bottom. Uh, these were error responses for authentication. So I was able to go through and see which errors were what and having those responses auto load up on the client, see what they were, and then uh, figure out the success route. Uh, oh, and uh, the other thing is, since we're modifying a client, you can modify, or you're hosting the CERD files that the client is touching, so it's really easy to just quickly modify and, and toy with it and have the client automatically uh, parse this data and go from there. So, for example, when we were trying to log in, we just made our username like 100 A's, which isn't realistic on a console standpoint, but we just pretend that it was that, and then we can start going through memory looking for those 100 A's, and then go from there, hey, where is it comparing the username? Uh, so, just a quick example of authentication logic that you can do since you're mainly dealing with a client is, um, you don't have to actually reverse the entire thing. You don't have to actually understand it. You just need to get the client to continue. You'll see us do this trick throughout the project. Um, for example, authentication. We tell it to authenticate to the server. And on our server, we just go ahead and have some back end that checks if that user account exists, whatever. And then if it doesn't, or if it was correct, we either send a generic error or a generic success, and it continues. Um, the reason is because there were errors like uh, session already active, uh, password is wrong, uh, username doesn't exist, all of that crap. You don't have to actually figure that out. You can just do it on your own. Uh, the other main issue is SSL. Uh, so what can you do? You can buy the domain. You could uh, you know, purchase one, look for a hash collision. Once again, not realistic. Um, good luck. Um, for some reason, back in like 2007, 2008, Konami successfully did SSL cert pinning. Have no idea how they did it. Uh, we still have to explain to people how to do it in 2014, but they did it. So we were kind of screwed in that part. 
But once again, the PS3 we were able to patch. So we were able to just throw our own cert in there. And in the future, if you were to ever do anything with the PS3, uh, there is a cert store in there in Flash. And you can throw your own certs in there or check whatever application you're hacking on our game, check what cert it's using, and you might be able to just make your own cert that would be accepted. All right, so that's kind of the boring stuff, the known protocols, the uh, things that you could basically do, common sense. I mean, it's a known protocol. You can just kind of sit there and put up something to handle it. Uh, jumping into the uh, unknown protocol, the actual game server now, though. I mean, we've mentioned it a few times here, packets. If you have packets, if you can get them, that's the easiest way to do this. Looking at the packets, uh, in our case, I mean, we did get a very minimal packet capture. Um, it didn't even include things like creating a game or joining a game, so it wasn't terribly useful for any functionality that you'd actually want. But it was something to kind of help us. Uh, and the big thing is just examine and compare everything. So these are the packets that we are getting in. Obviously, this is the hacks. We're getting this just in. You know, the bytes. We weren't getting the ask of this. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually read Hex fluently, but I mean, looking at this, I mean, I, I notice a 41 up there on the first one there. I mean, that's the A. A lot of people will recognize that one. Um, there are a few other characters, but I mean, if you can't really recognize any pattern in this, um, next steps, you know, looking at the ASCII of it. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone really understands what's going on here either, so I mean, perhaps a larger packet might help. I mean, you. Actually, right now, you can kind of start to see the ZP there um, down one of the columns there. You always know Z and P coming right after each other. So that's one thing. No sense some larger packets. Of course, I don't expect anyone really knows what this is yet. If you do, well, you've probably seen this before. But if you keep looking at this, you'll start noticing a okay, 5A70. We've mentioned this, the ZP. Notice maybe the 85, the AF you know, more characters, and you notice that these come up always in the same column. They're always kind of in the same place in there. So there are a few things. The other thing you can notice, there are no null bytes anywhere in this either. So that's basically two clues of what's going on with these packets. You've got no null bytes, and you've got those four bytes that basically repeat. If you've, if you've uh, never seen this before, then, you know, you might be stumped for a little while on what the heck's going on there. But if you're familiar with it, it's just an XOR. Uh, four byte hard coded key in there that just XORs every single packet coming through. So ultimately, it's as soon as you realize that, suddenly this makes a lot more sense. You see things like the gate, you see IPs in there. This makes sense. The other thing you end up coming up, so now we've XORed these packets, but some of these aren't necessarily too clear. Uh, you'll notice coming up on there, these are just some of the packets that we'd go through, and you can notice a few patterns. First one you might notice is the number there that just kind of goes up, uh, one, two, three, four. Um, counts there. We kind of figured out that, that was probably a sequence with every pack that the client sent it went up by one with every pack this uh, server and our capture had, it would go up by one. So a sequence makes sense there just by looking at these numbers. Uh, the other one here, I believe, is the payload size. You'll notice that it gets larger every time you've got kind of the big payload coming in there. Then these ones, uh, we basically just call them the command IDs. Every command that comes in will have this unique identifier. We're going to cover a few of them, but I mean, there's like 80 different commands that actually come in here. Then obviously the payload. We notice there's kind of the minimum size where if we had like a zero payload size, we had nothing in this box. And then there are these random things here. Um, I'll know about any of you. When I see random, my first thought normally wrong is prime numbers. I mean, prime numbers are generally kind of randomly distributed, things like that. That has nothing to do in this case, but it is always my first thought. If you take a look at these, though, if we just pull them out and look them, there are these probably look a little familiar, basically being MD5 in really small text. Yeah, that's uh, we just guessed that those were command IDs, yeah, and a, that a large sample of them. Yeah, yeah uh, we were able to see this coming in from the client. We saw that this part would always be the same, but the uh, hash might be different. So it was just a guess at this point. Uh, later on, it ends up being confirmed, but at this point, we just guessed. 
So yeah, and then you've got MD5 there. Uh, we figured out that's the header and the payload being hashed together, just an MD5. And the PS3 did HMAC in that, but essentially just it's a hash for the actual packet coming in. So what we've come up with is basically this protocol. And I jumped through this really quickly in just a few minutes. I'm mentioning exactly what this layout is. Realistically, this was not done just in, you know, 15 minutes. It took a lot of comparison. It takes a lot longer than what you're going to see here. Oh, okay. No, you're doing this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the ideal way of kind of going through with these are the having the packet capture. So for the sake of completeness, we'll give a quick example of that. Uh, basically, if you've got the packet capture, you can see what's coming in. You can see what's going out. Just a matter of figuring out that transformation. I mean, function X, just X goes in, Y comes out, what's happening there. So as an example here, the first packet on this is what comes in. The second packet is what we know comes out from a packet capture. So you can look at it. We can confirm now the uh, uh, sequence numbers there, the 0 and 1 coming out of that. So the uh, PS2 and the server both have their own sequences. Uh, it's not uh, continuing from each other pretty much as you'd expect. And then we notice the 20, 0, 1, and responses 0, 2, and 0, 3. Uh, and these packets, again, if you don't read hacks, uh, it's our uh, lobby listing. So I'd shown this earlier also. Uh, what we've got is, I'll make that look a little nicer, the, basically the lobby names um, and IPs in there. Trying to figure out what this actual data is, though. I mean, there's the dots in there. If I pull those out, uh, you kind of have to start figuring out what these numbers mean. I mean, we know what's going to come out. We can maybe edit the text and see things reflected there, but there are still these numbers like zero, the first set there, zero, one, two, three, four. Pretty easy to just guess. It's probably an identifier. Every row just has an incremental identifier. Uh, and actually playing around with this, those numbers made no difference whatsoever. So we can supply with like minus one all the way through, but we've stuck with what they actually used. The next one here was a little bit more interesting there, 01222. Uh, and basically from having played the game, I could see these uh, gate and account, the first two lobbies listed there. I had never seen these before. Uh, so these were hidden from the player, but the snake, liquid, and the league lobbies I had seen previously. So I could figure out that these are probably types. I mean, zero for your gate, one for account, two for the actual type. And sure enough, um, You'll notice later that, that was an accurate guess. The next thing we see is one, two, and then A, B, C. This one, it's like, what happened to everything between two and A? I mean, the other one, you know, we have one, two, three, four, but this kind of jumps a few. Turns out what this probably was is the uh, Japanese servers took, you know, um, a globally unique ID. So Japanese servers, you know, had one through 10, and then we had A through there. So. Moving on, um, the only other number we had was 90. Couldn't really get much from it at this point, so the real question comes down to experimentation. We had some visible names, like I mentioned, we had lobby names in there, we had IPs, so I just said some listeners, and changed that unknown value, just gave it a, um, you know, A through E to see what came out of it. And sure enough, we see lobbies named A, lobbies named B, C and then 67, 68, 69 for ABC there. So that was easy, just dealing with the packet capture. So a little bit of a harder way would be that we don't have a packet capture to analyze. So the question before is how did we know it was a command ID? Uh, when we were looking at various packet captures where, hey, this was me logging in, this was me joining a game, we could kind of see the sequence of authentication and we saw the repeating commands with similar payloads, so we just assumed. Uh, for some of these, uh, we had no packet capture. For actually most of them, we had no packet capture. So what could we do to determine the payload? Um, we could check for like known uh, encodings, like is it XML, is it JSON, um, is it doing crypto? We stuck a good link uh, in there for a little bit of a write-up on crypto. Obviously, we can do a whole talk on crypto, but we're not going to because we're bad at math. So, uh, no known format. 
Um, what we started playing with uh, were some of the responses uh, to the client, obviously, and we figured out that the first four bytes were usually an error code. If it was zeros, that was a success. If it was anything other than zero, it would error up, and we generally see an error on the client side on the game. Um, and then the server command ID is usually plus one of the request, which you saw um, with the responses earlier with the 2002, then the next response was 2003. So we started experimenting. Um, you know, could we just give it a success and will the client continue on? This was a little bit similar to the HTTP logic where um, could we just tell the client to continue ex execution? Does it actually matter if we are correct or not? And um, was it actually expecting data? Would, would it just go, what version am I, or just continue? Uh, the next thing was uh, trying to basically give it an error and figure out what it was. Since we knew that it would give an error out, and when it would respond with an error, it would respond with the command ID that did error, we were able to just kind of fuzz uh, some of these payloads. So if it sent a 3012 response, we could just start sending a bunch of ones with a bunch of command IDs. And the moment the client sends an error back to the server, we know what response it was actually expecting from that command, which is just basically looping with errors. So we can move, around, move on. It's, it's just, I mean, most of this is not technical. It's just a little tedious. Um, same thing, a lot of guess, guesswork, uh, blank responses, nulls, 0x30s again, going from there. And um, as I said, a lot of it's just client communication, just uh, moving it on. I guess I covered all this. <laughs> so um, exploring items, for example, uh, touching a little bit on the game store that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a packet capture we had. Uh, we truncated it as much larger, but uh, just quickly looking at it, we have a 24 at the beginning, and we kind of knew that we had probably about 24 items of clothing, so we just assumed that's the number of entries. And then we started noticing a byte that was ascending, and then um, a couple bytes after that. So we were able to figure out that the ascending byte was actually an item ID, and the colors after that were color codes. And we were able to do, start enumerating uh, these items uh, through just tricking the client. So the client has access to everything in the game. It just consistently checks with the server, can it, can it touch those? For example, like DLCs, um, the client will have all the DLC. It just checks with the server if you paid for it. But the files are already there. Uh, so exploring items, we go ahead and uh, make the first uh, byte a zero. So we have a length as, or the amount of items as a zero, and obviously it's all blank. So we go ahead and increase it to a one, and now all of a sudden we have a beret. And then we could start uh, enumerating different item IDs and see what other berets are there. These are all uh, headgear. Um, but playing with some of the color codes, just going through there, oh, there's another color uh, as we start changing them. And um, and we were just able to map out each item and each characteristic for the item. Uh, same thing for the shirts. Uh, we gave it an amount of zero, and it gave us this jacket. So they had kind of like uh, an error check. If the data didn't make sense, just give them this this item. This is like the the standard cookie cutter item that they'll just be stuck with. And they did this throughout the client a lot. So even if you're uh, information that you gave it were inc was incorrect. It might still just continue with its own, with its own uh, fake data. Um, and then right there, we we changed the item code, and suddenly we have a T-shirt, and start going from there. So a little interesting is uh, this mask is um, was unknown. Like nobody knew this mask existed. Uh, we don't know if it was a dev item. It's this crazy Japanese wrestler. But we were actually able to find it in the game doing this, uh, which was kind of neat. We also found other dev-only items like T-shirts um, that had lines on them that you could tell uh, were for the texture artist to kind of do the correct dimensions and stuff. It was uh, just kind of interesting. So slow and tedious, uh, not too tif difficult. So uh, what do you do with the more complex payloads? Uh, you still don't have packets, and is it easily guessable? Like, 
not really. So friends list, for example, we had a friends list and we started doing guesswork, zeros, nulls, what have you, and uh, we were just coming up with nothing. Uh, we filled it up with A's, nothing. So we were just getting this error. Um, after we went back and started analyzing what type of packets we've seen in the past, um, we've seen that there's client update packets, client request packets, and lists. So client update packets would be like the client update in the server. These were the stats of the game. The server says, okay, cool. Client request would be what are my settings, and the server tells it a response of what your settings are. And then a list, which would be a packet saying, uh, are you prepared to receive some data? It would respond with yes. It would do the list of data and then send it. Once it's done, send it a, I'm done sending that data. So uh, we started playing around with this list idea and uh, went ahead and did the empty start packet with 4580 as uh, zero, sent it 4581 with an empty, and then 4583 with a success. And we got an empty player list. So now we weren't getting that error. So we made some progress. So what about that middle packet that had the list? What happens if we just fill it with some random data? Now we have friends, cool. So obviously we threw a ton of characters in there, 100, and suddenly we have two friends. So we know that there's some, some data in between that we're missing. So we had to start mapping that out. Uh, so through like this in here, and you can kind of see between the A and C, there's some missing. Um, and later on, we started going through and figuring out that this was that this player is currently in a game. This player is playing in this lobby, et cetera, et cetera. But we won't really touch base with that. It's just an example of how we mapped out some of these more, I guess, involved payloads. Uh, so we went ahead and uh, successfully figured that out. So I mean, doing those payloads there, you kind of have something to look at. You've got uh, the output on there. You can see where you know certain characters are being output to. You can see the requests that come because of it. With the player list, maybe if you try, uh, there's a function where you could join the game that the player is currently in. So if you do that and you see what game it tries to join, you see the command that it'll send out. So you can see where your data is kind of coming out in that. So the outputs both what you see there and just commands coming out from it. Join game, however, um, probably an important function. I mean, we had a single player server up, uh, just sending out those fake success. We were able to get a uh, create game working, but we didn't have any join game working for, I think it was about 10 months after we had made that progress. And join game is kind of important if you want to have a multiplayer server. It's, you kind of want to be able to play with other people instead of running around a map on your own. In this case, we had no packets to work from. It certainly wasn't easily guessable. And there was really nothing similar. It wasn't one of those list things. We just kind of had to figure things out and hope for the best there. So looking at the actual thing, you basically have a game. The game list there was one of those list type uh, responses and a few options, join game, host info, player list. So the first step is when we try to uh, join a game it would send this command 4113. And we were able to recognize from these other options, I mean, if you tried to send the host info to the player list, uh, sending the host info, or making the host info request would give you that same command, 4113. So from that, we can easily just determine, okay, this is probably your host info. So once we were able to kind of map out the proper information gain, just looking at what the output of our, you know, sending A, sending B, sending all that stuff out of the host info, we were able to get that going and figure out what's in there. The next thing was player stats. Uh, this was a weird one. It, it's not a list packet exactly, but it does somewhat follow that format. Uh, this is actually a pack that I'm still trying to figure out exactly how it goes, just uh, doing some static analysis on it. Uh, so trying to figure out the response to this pack did take some uh, reverse engineering on it. The elf was packed, as I mentioned, um, on the PS2, so it's not like you can just kind of dump it afterwards and execute uh, the code you get out of the dump. Uh, no official debugging functionality. Uh, from the emulator, as uh, Joseph mentioned earlier, we were able to get kind of this memory dump. A little bit awkward, I mean, start the game up in an emulator, go through the slowness of that, because I don't have a good laptop or good computer for that. And eventually it's like you make a save state and hey, here's a dump of the memory that the emulator has. So it wasn't exact, 
but it was able to help us. So one of the first things you're going to try and do is find where the code's actually executing. I mean, even if we could, you know, just break at some random point, odds are we're going to be in some type of display loop, just kind of looping over there, not actually anything helpful. So we need to find our actual code area where the code we care about is executing. So one of the easy things to do is look for nearby strings. In our case, there were none. We didn't have any strings. I mean, this wasn't a console application, so a lot of the strings are going to be sitting in a graphics loop, whereas what we want is not. Uh, so what we did look for were just kind of magic numbers. 4103, kind of look for that, but only being two bytes, there were a lot of false positives. I mean, those bytes just kind of showed up in code randomly quite a bit. Uh, but the XOR code that I mentioned earlier, as we were kind of looking at the packets, we were able to find where that sat in memory, and then we looked for what places um, actually reference that, and basically came across a nice list, or a nice switch statement, which basically looked, you know, is, this, is the command coming in 4104, is it 4105, 4103? So we were able to find our 4103, which was our game. Uh, and basically immediately after he basically just got jumped. So we wanted to find our way to get that jump. The function itself, you start stepping into it, had several calls in basically the form of a jump or a function call, and then would check if the value was not zero. Uh, branch if it's not zero and repeat that about 15 times. So you kind of have two options if you want to get past this. One is you follow the code path, determine what actually ends up failing. Um, and then when you know what check actually fails, you're able to either nop, just put a nop in there, uh, nullify the check, or figure out what data would actually make a pass. The ideal way is, of course, figuring out what data would make it pass. Uh, in this case, it was a fairly complex payload. I haven't figured out all of the stats yet. Uh, so we end up needing to patch this out, just basically giving it a return zero so it'll accept any stats we give it. Um, from what I've been able to figure out, it's similar to a list, but a lot larger. It's like um, embedded lists, I think, right now. I'm still working on this packet. Uh, so patch it out, kind of let us get through it. Uh, so our join game, we've got the game information, then requested the player information, uh, then requested the player stats of the host, the host stats, and now we're sending yet another packet. And all of this is being done with pretty much no output to kind of work from. So I have to start thinking, okay, 4320, what's that going to be requesting? I mean, it's already got the stats, it's already got player information, game, it's got everything in there already. So we started looking to some external resources at this point uh, before we jump straight to static analysis and getting in at that level. You know, Google is your friend. Turns out there were, you know, other online games. In this case, I'm working on Metal Gear Online 1 at this point. So there was Pro Evolution Soccer came out. I think maybe three months after Metal Gear Online 1 and Metal Gear Online 2, which actually had this particular packet in the capture that we had. So what ended up being was just the um, host information, the IP stuff, things like that. So it makes sense that would be sent there, but wasn't quite sure exactly what would be coming, just looking at it from kind of an outside perspective. Now, at this point, we actually had a connection going. The client who's trying to join the game would actually start sending packets out to that host, but the host suddenly sends us yet another new packet, 4340. And at this point, it's like, hey, we've got the game ID, we've, or we've got the game information there, we've, everything's been sent. What is the host asking for now? Uh, no error messages, uh, so we can just kind of loop over to try and figure that out. Uh, because this is just being sent while you're already in a game, so it's someone trying to join. And the request, the payload, all it contained was a, um, the joining player ID. So what we were able to find was this 4341, which we hadn't handled yet, kind of in that switch statement, and found where it jumped off to, found a function call, and basically followed it through. So coming down to static analysis, uh, the function ended up making a lot of calls, but it would never check the return value. It seemed like it was just kind of setting itself up to look for something, and it would only read four bytes from the payload. If we sent it more, it would still only read the four bytes. So I basically ended up figuring, uh, from looking through, this is 
obviously not all the code there, but a couple of jumps, and then it does a check, uh, the branch equal. Uh, so at that point, I basically figured out it's probably that success code, those first four bytes. Um, and I'm not really including that with the payload. That's just kind of a padding. It's always sent. And then a player ID, uh, which was, so basically this ended up working like an echo command, echo back whatever got sent. And we had the first game. We were able to play the first game in about six years just by that easy packet. Although this packet took probably three months of work to figure out. <laughs> so could have had it earlier if I just tried to replay that. Yeah. Right, so the uh, multiplayer game's working. Uh, so what's next? What if you want to keep hacking on this game? So we have this kid on our team, Javier. Uh, I just call him the crazy Indian kid. Uh, the whole time we were working on this protocol, he was actually toying around with the game files. Um, all the game files had their own encryptions and formats, and he started playing with this. And as you can see in the picture, he figured out the map format and also the collision mapping and the lighting. And um, he was actually uh, able to load custom maps, and uh, which was pretty badass in my opinion. Uh, so. Once we finished hacking on the protocol, it's just kind of moved on to let's hack on the actual game and and run with it from there. But uh, I mean, that could be its own talk. So conclusion. Yeah, so I mean, this talk basically, um, we've gone through it in what, maybe 40, 44 minutes here. Uh, each game took about 10 months of work. I mean, casual works, we weren't actually sitting there like eight hour days or anything doing that but it took a lot more work than what you see here. Uh, we cover maybe six commands, whereas there were about 80 that we actually had to handle. Uh, I mean, there were, uh, there's not a lot of existing reference material for us to work with, which was part of why we decided to end up doing this talk. So there's no information talking about actually trying to build a server from nothing. I mean, there's a little bit on private servers uh, where you have a live server, but not so much on this. And one thing is if you try and do this, people are somewhat crazy. Uh, trolls, complaints, uh, legal threats. I mean, people who just like didn't like how we handled something, suddenly they're going to go report us to Konami, who really couldn't do much, uh, since there is an exception on the DMCA for doing some of this work. Uh, but yeah, I mean, then there's the copyright issues in the US, DMCA, uh, they kind of have to be aware of. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really speak too much on that, but hopefully I'm in the clear. Uh, just some quick credits here. Uh, we have Derek, who helped out on both of the game servers. Uh, Zach kind of got us started, uh, did some of the groundwork. Um, Hellstan, he, uh, he did the Pro Evolution Soccer server. It wasn't, or the server itself wasn't a huge amount of help, but I was able to bounce some questions off of him and get some uh, confirmations of what I was thinking. Uh, so, I mean, he definitely helped out there. Uh, what the fuck are you thinking? Did some work on the PS3, and we've already mentioned Jay doing some of the mapping work. Uh, there are links for when you get the downloads, and we've got a few minutes here if there are any questions. Questions, questions? Yeah, in the back there. All right, so the question was just about um, whether or not we actually had multiplayer working and the state information going back and forth. Uh, what we end up having, this was a peer-to-peer -peer game. So, I mean, there are servers where the game basically communicates everything back to the server. You know, player moves one step, it goes to the server. In our case, that went to the host player. So we didn't have to deal with a lot of that information. As soon as the players were able to join, uh, we basically had multiplayer work. We didn't have to handle a lot of those commands like you would in another server. So that's how we dealt with that, by ignoring it. <laughs> yeah, and um, the SaveMGO website, you can join the server right now. We have like 80 to 100 people that are constantly playing. The catch-22 is if you're going to play the PS3 version, you need a hacked console. Um, I mean, I am kind of looking at the SSL library that it's using and some of the game functions and hoping to see if there might be a vulnerability somewhere and we could exploit that and do it live so people with uh, a regular console could start playing, just like connect to the server, 
run our patch and and go from there but uh, for right now you do need custom firmware but you can totally start playing with the ps2 or the ps3 any other questions any 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 okay well, then i guess we're done <laughs> All right, thank you